Faculty Echo. I am so excited to start uh, this program and moving our international mentorship program into this platform. So thank you everyone for your patience for our starting five minutes late uh, for this uh, first adventurous uh, group meeting. So um, today is September 14th, 2023. And today, uh, Michelle Alanis, I hope I'm present, uh, saying that correctly, uh, will be talking about executive function treatment and assessment. So how this meeting is going to work is she'll provide us with a 30 minute presentation and then she's going to present a case study and then we'll break out into groups to really talk about uh, the questions for the case study and then we'll come back together as a large group. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, but I'm going to let Michelle take it away and introduce herself. Uh, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so honored to be here to be able to share this information with you. And um, I am an occupational therapist. I work in pediatrics in Southern California, and I'm also the director of an outpatient pediatric clinic. So we use executive function a lot in our clinic, both the therapist and the clients. So I think it's a very pertinent topic that you're gonna enjoy learning about. So let's start out by talking about what is executive function. Executive function is a group of complex mental processes and cognitive abilities that control skills required for goal-directed behavior. So that's a lot, that's a mouthful, but essentially executive function is how we engage and stay focused and complete all of our goal-directed behaviors, getting up in the morning and getting ready, making a meal for ourselves, doing our work, tending to our garden, taking care of our leisure activities, all of those things require executive function. So it's a very big umbrella of cognitive um, processes. And today we're gonna be focusing on three of the key elements of this executive function. And those are inhibition, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. So again, executive function is the overall umbrella, and then these are um, underneath that umbrella. These are components of executive function. So we'll start out by defining what inhibition is. You want to go back one more slide, Kate. So inhibition is, there we go, the ability to manage our internal and our external distractions. So right now I'm talking to you in where I'm at. It's getting close to lunchtime. I can feel my stomach grumbling a little bit, but I can ignore that distraction and stay focused on presenting with you. Or I'm also here working at my clinic and sometimes there's background noise that comes, but I can tune that out and be able to stay focused on what's happening here. All of those skills are requiring inhibition, and it really is a foundational skill for sustained attention. Next up, let's talk about working memory. Working memory is your ability to mentally manipulate multiple ideas at once. So this is a key element for things like following directions. Let's say your friend says, oh, to get to my house, you go down the street, the third street on the left, you turn right, you'll see a shop there, and it's right past the shop. You have to hold on to all of those um, those directions as you're executing the task. Or if you're doing a recipe and you read the recipe and you're trying to remember those things as you're implementing it. Um, that's what working memory is. And then finally, we'll talk about cognitive flexibility. And this is just basically the ability to adapt. Things change and you have to be able to adapt to that situation. I was trying to log in, it was not working, so I had to switch what I was doing and try a different approach. That's cognitive flexibility. And it's also that ability to go back and forth, kind of shift your attention or divide your attention. So you're working on something, someone stops by and talks to you and you're able to then redirect yourself back to the task that you were doing. You have the flexibility to stop and also the ability to get back on task afterwards. So those are the three key elements we're going to review today, inhibition, working memory, executive function, um, cognitive flexibility. And there are ways to measure these skills. There's both direct measures, and that's where we're actually testing the, the skill itself and observing how the client is responding to it. But there's also indirect measures, and that's where someone is reporting how, it, how a client is doing um, with their executive function. We'll start by talking about the direct measures. 
I've tried to source a few measures that are available free online for anyone to access. The first one here is for children and the second one is for adults. And this is a very, these are very functional measures. And what that means is we're having the clients do something that they would do in their everyday life normally, like um, for the pediatric one, it's, it's, it's putting together a recipe, cooking something, and we watch to see how they're able to do all of these skills, inhibition, working memory, cognitive flexibility, and we're able to rate them on those things. So it's very useful because you get to see in real life how the executive function skills may be breaking down. But it's also very useful to be able to measure directly the executive function. So if you want to know, for example, how a client's skills with inhibition are, you can use a direct measure of that skill. And so I've also sourced two um, assessments for, for that uh, activity, which are free and available online. The Stroop Color and Word Task is a very commonly used intervention where, uh, I'm sorry, um, a measure where the, the word is one color, um, but you're supposed to say the other. So for example, the text will say green, but the text will be colored red. And you're supposed to say red because you're just reading the, you're, you're naming the color. So it really requires that cognitive flexibility because you wanna say green because that's what the text says. Um, or it also requires that inhibition because your, your initial instinct is to just read the word, not say the color. So um, that's an example of how we measure directly the executive function of inhibition. And then next up is the indirect measures. So this is when someone else is reporting for you, how is the client performing on their executive function? The most commonly used uh, measure is the brief. You see that across the board and all of the literature um, on pediatrics and executive function, but there are also free questionnaires online that you can use to get an idea of how someone is functioning. If they can't report for themselves or you can't observe it for them for yourself, or if you just want to see how they are in different environments. Okay, so that covers all of the baseline information. Now let's talk about the exciting stuff. How can we intervene on these skills of inhibition, working memory, and cognitive flexibility? Well, when you look into the literature, pretty much all of the studies fall into these three categories, either exercise, meditation, or cognitive training. And I'm gonna take you through each of these interventions and tell you who it works for, why we think it works, as well as um, just different components of that intervention. So we're gonna start with exercise because exercise is my favorite one to implement with my clients. You can see that the populations that benefit from exercise for improving executive function are so many. It's such a variety of populations that have been studied using exercise. Both neurotypical people who have had no injuries and are just typically developing and just wanna improve their cognition, as well as people that have had injuries, um, both adults and children. So it's a very prolific intervention. And what are the characteristics of this? Well, when you look at the exercise research, they're all either smart exercises or repetitive exercise. A smart exercise is where the, the client really has to think it through. It's an open task. They have to work and adjust. So an example of a smart exercise would be like a sports-driven um, exercise. So like cricket or soccer, where there's a lot of things that are changing and you're having to adjust to it. Compare that to a repetitive exercise, which is more of a closed exercise, something like running or cycling, where there's not a lot of cognitive demand on the task. Now, both of these types of exercises have been proven to be effective for improving executive function. And we'll talk a little bit later about why, but it's fascinating why. Because you would kind of think, oh, the smart exercise is going to be the one. Um, but both of them are effective. And the other thing that you'll see is there's a lot of variety in the intensity of the exercise intervention. There have been studies looking at a low intensity exercise where your heart rate is relatively low, like going on a walk, um, or moderate intensity or even vigorous intensity. And that's based on how hard your body is working for the exercise. And each of those have evidence bases. And sometimes it depends on what you're trying to target, um, which intensity you might choose. 
A good rule of thumb is low to moderate intensity exercise. Is um, Those are the most popular ones in the research for exercise. And then finally, looking at the duration, it's really exciting to see how quickly clients make gains in their cognitive abilities with just this short amount of intervention. Sometimes we work with our clients over and over again to try to get gains and it takes a long time. But for the most part, the duration of the intervention is not that long. And then also um, research looks at acute and chronic. So acute would be like just one, one set of exercise. They'll have the subjects come in, they'll measure their executive function, they'll have them do a hard run, and then they'll measure it again. So it's an acute exercise bout. But they also look at chronic exercise interventions where it's like embedded in a school program, or it happens over a summer camp, or it's happening over a, a longer period of time. So all of those types of exercises are, um, are evidence-based for improving executive function. And why does it work? Well, that's the proposed mechanism of action. So the mechanism of action is, is why, what is the theory? Why do we think it's working? And the reason that we feel that exercise is so effective for improving executive function is because of the neurological changes that we get with exercise. So when you work out, first of all, you have just an increase in arousal. Your body kind of wakes up. So um, you're at more of an optimal level for learning new skills. But also there's an increase of blood flow. So your brain is actually quite hungry. It, it needs a lot of blood in order to be able to work hard. And so when we exercise, we increase that blood flow that goes to the brain. And so that helps. And then there's all of these beautiful neurochemicals that get released when we exercise. And those neurochemicals have different functions. Some of them enhance our concentration. Some of them actually um, create an environment of neuroplasticity. So for example, brain-derived neurotrophic factor is often released in, in, when people exercise. And that is a neurochemical that helps with um, creating new synapses in the brain so that when you have exercised, you've created this environment in your brain that is now ready to learn because not only is your arousal optimal, the blood flow is going, but also there's this cocktail of neurochemicals in your brains that are just ready to make new connections. And so that's why exercise is such an effective intervention intervention. But we also add to that, that if we're engaging in a um, open, um, smart exercise, that the complexity of the motor task itself is also targeting executive function. So you can imagine how you have to be cognitively flexible if you're playing a game of cricket, or how you have to really in, um, use your inhibition to stay focused and remain um, remain vigilant when you're playing a, a group sport. So the complexity of the motor task itself also facilitates executive function skills. So let's move on to another um, category of intervention, which is meditation. So the populations that benefit from this are a little bit more um, succinct than the ones that benefit from exercise, but still quite a few people have shown to have improved cognition as a result of engaging in meditation interventions. And there's different types of intervention that have been represented in the research. What I've tried to do on the next slide is I've tried to provide you an application for a free um, phone app that you can utilize for training meditation and mindfulness, but there are all sorts of different ones that you can engage your clients in. And for the most part, they're focusing on that skill of inhibition where they're focusing the mind, they're um, learning to, to rotate their mind back to what they were focusing on when they get distracted. And so it makes a lot of sense that the mechanism of action really is that they're engaging your attention training. And the other interesting thing about why we think meditation works is when they do EEGs of patients who are engaging in um, meditation, they find actually that the, um, the brain it gets into an alpha wave state, which is our where we are relaxed, basically. When you're having a lot of alpha waves, that's where you're in a relaxed but focused state of mind. And so meditation and mindfulness helps to get us to that state of mind, which again, now we're at an optimal level for learning and we're able to uh, incorporate these new executive function skills. 
And then finally, there's intervention that targets specific cognitive training. So that's where they're actually looking at an individual skill like inhibition, and they're training that skill. So the populations that benefit, again, are a little bit more succinct than the ones for exercise, but still many people benefit from actually practicing the skill. So for example, um, a characteristic of cognitive training intervention would be where you have a computer application or a phone application and the client is, is training on that application and it's targeting their inhibition skills. So next slide, Kate. So for example, there is a research-based um, application called Guacamole. It's a freely available um, app that was studied and researched by NYU to improve executive function. And it's basically these avocados with silly faces and it shows you which ones you're supposed to smash and which ones you're not supposed to smash. And you play that game. So it's training your working memory and your inhibition. And we find that if we do specifically train a skill, that skill will improve. But there is a caveat to know. If you train inhibition, you might think, okay, I've improved their inhibition, I've improved their focus, their ability to attend, therefore their working memory is also going to improve. And what we find with, um, ex with executive function intervention is that it's very finite. If you improve inhibition, you've only improved inhibition. It's not going to have a carryover effect to any of the other skills. So if you're doing cognitive training, it has to be very specific to the skill that you want to improve and recognize that it's not just going to spontaneously carry over to the other ones. And then the mechanism of action. Why does it work to just target that skill? Well, I think we've all heard the saying, what fires together, wires together, because essentially the more you practice a skill, the more efficient the brain gets at executing that skill. So if you practice working memory, you're gonna get better at working memory. Now, I want to go into an actual protocol that's in the literature that I think is so much fun for when I'm working with my clients, and it's highly adaptable. So this particular intervention is using table tennis as the, as the sport, but I really feel like you could take this and modify it based on your client's interests. So if they love soccer, you could do a very similar protocol using soccer instead. Um, the, in the research, I've also seen basketball as one of them. Uh, for this particular protocol, it's really um, an eye-hand co coordination sport. So cricket and soccer and basketball and football and pretty much if it has a ball involved, you could adapt this intervention so that you can find what your client's really excited about and then use that as the protocol. So this is evidence-based. It was over 12 weeks and they were doing 70 minutes twice weekly when they um, implemented this. And this is with children with autism. That's my primary population that I treat. So I was really excited when I found this intervention. And the overview of how you would set up your training program is when the client comes in, you do a short warm up and then you do some motor skill training, target executive function motor skills. They did some group games and then a cool down. So I'm gonna take you through each one of those. Starting with a warm up, it's just what you would think, five minutes of stretching or jogging, and then going into specific motor skill training. This is where they're actually teaching them the, the motor skill task of different stroke patterns related to table tennis. And again, the reason this is working is because as they're engaging in the activity, their heart rate is elevating. So they're getting that beautiful neurochemical cocktail in their brain, and they're having to problem solve and adjust as the ball is coming and make Make those processing um, judgments, which is uh, targeting all of those executive function skills. And then they follow that by doing specific executive function motor skills. So now we're still using the table tennis, the paddle and the ball, but now we're embedding um, different executive function challenges into it. So maybe in embedding novelty or randomness or doing different cognitive tasks with it. So for example, um, maybe you're having them, you're, you're sending balls to them and having them hit the balls, but you tell them, I want you only to hit the yellow balls. Do not hit the white ones. So you're sending different colors and they're having to use their working memory so that they know which one to hit and which one not, and also use their inhibition so that they don't hit it even when it's coming at them. 
And then um, after that, they would do group games. So these are cooperative games, basically where you're playing with another client or playing with another person so that you've increased that social engagement with it. And then finally, they'll do, do a cool down. So that's the overview of the intervention. And they found that they made um, quite a bit of progress with the client. So let's talk one more time about the mechanism of action. So they're using that open skill, that smart exercise, where it's unpredictable environment. And they're having to really, there's a high cognitive load to the task. And they're also using exercise, so they're getting that neuroplasticity, that neurological environment that's really helping to solidify those connections when they're making those cognitive um, judgments through the motor training. Okay, so that is the... Um, the presentation and now we're going to talk about a case study. The case study is a patient whose name is Jacob and he's a 14 year old boy and he has autism and he has level two symptoms. So that means that he requires substantial support and he has a functional impairment that is due to impulsive behaviors and rigid thinking. And some of the things that we're finding with him is poor safety awareness, insistence on sameness, so that rigidity, and also selective eating. He'll only eat certain things, certain color, certain textures. And the parent is really concerned because this is causing a lot of problems for them. At home, Jacob insists that the mom sits in one location and he does not want her to get up and move around. And when she does get up and move around, he gets emotionally dysregulated. And so that's causing, as you can imagine, a lot of difficulty at home. And on top of that, if they're out in the community and something slightly unexpected happens, she takes a different path to get somewhere. Or one thing um, that she brought up to me is when she tries to park her car, sometimes when you go to park, you don't get it just right the first time. You kind of have to back out and do it again. And if she has to do that, that will be a trigger for him. And he'll have these large emotional outbursts with these big crocodile tears because he's just so upset that something different has occurred. So we're going to go into our breakout rooms and I want you to consider this case study and um, think about what executive functions do you think are impaired and why do you think those are impaired? And then we'll come back together and talk about that. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. That was fantastic. Um, the facilitators each have the questions, um, but I'm gonna now put you into your rooms and uh, you just need to go on into your breakout rooms. I'm gonna continue the recording and I'd love it if the facilitators could sort of talk about what was discussed in the room for ideas. So Sarah, would you mind sharing first sort of some ideas that your room came up with? Yes, I was putting my background on for the group. Um, hi, everybody. I was in group two. My name's Sarah. I'm calling in from Boston. And in my group, I had um, members from California, Tanz uh, Tanzania, uh, Greece, Nambia, I believe. Um, I think I caught almost everybody. Um, our group um, uh, shared a few different things. One thing that really uh, stood out was that the sharing some approaches um, one member mentioned uh, using the co-op approach. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but helping to empower and, and teach the um, teach the client, um, you, know, like, you know, new ways to do things. Um, we also had a lot of discussion about the importance of collaboration um, with uh, uh, families, caregivers, and teachers. Um, some treatment ideas that were brought up uh, were really focused, yes, of course, on occupation-based, but also to really address working memory and inhibition. So uh, some ideas that came up were related to playing like literally a memory game with card games, um, or also just kind of changing up um, or making a game out of um, you know, different things in the classroom instructions, if you will. So. I hope I captured some of the themes, um, certainly not all of the vibrant discussion, but thanks, Kate. Thank you, Sarah. David, do you want to share what happened in your group? Oh, you're on mute, David. There we go. Um, there were five participants. Unfortunately, I didn't get their names, but everybody participated. Um, the 
group felt that cognitive flexibility was definitely impaired. There was rigidity, and there was some degree of inhibition that was uh, that was impaired because the people the 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 uh, client could not um, could not focus. The treatment activities that were recommended one was exercise, um, and they recommended some sort of reaching activity, maybe a stacking activity, ones involving slow movement. Um, the group did not feel that meditation would be useful for him. Uh, and maybe some sort of games like a, a jigsaw puzzle or a color sorting activity. Um, in terms of classroom recommendations, um, the main recommendation was that uh, he be involved with other students for social activity and that the teacher establish some sort of um, consistent program for him so that he would know, you know, he, he would be able to follow the same program every day and then gradually introduce some, some small changes. Um, and finally, uh, we didn't come up with a standardized assessment, but we did feel that the direct assessment through direct observation would be the most useful. Great, thank you, David. And Shannon, do you wanna share a little bit about what your group had to say? Yes, hi, Kate, I will. So, I had six people in my group and everyone agreed that there were some cognitive and inhibition issues. Um, for treatment, someone suggested um, for eating, like since he's a picky eater, put snacks into a, a container and have him pick out different snacks. Um, they also agreed on exercise, like to integrate body awareness. Um, they also said some cognitive training and trying to adapt to change. Hopefully that would help him. Um, for in the classroom, they said improving working memory by using puzzles and card games. Um, we really didn't get a standardized assessment. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I just want to give a shout out for Shannon because Shannon is entering OT school in the fall. So we met, snaps for Shannon, we met on a trip um, where she went to Bulgaria and Greece with me this summer and we were doing OT um, with different people. So thank you so much, Shannon. I really appreciate your enthusiasm for the profession. We can't wait for you to join us. So thank you for being here. Uh, Michelle, we did, I would love for you to comment on um, sort of the the group's discussion and also on that um, that comment in the chat box that I forgot to mention earlier. Yes, I will start with the chat box. Oops, you're on mute. I don't know if she's muted or frozen. Okay, I think I fixed it. I'm so sorry. Can you That's hear me now? Yep, you're great. Okay, perfect. So the question was, are swimming pool lessons count as a smart or a repetitive exercise? That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. It depends on how you execute it. So typical um, like swimming laps, if it's something that they already know how to do and they're just doing a rote closed movement um, process like swimming laps, that would not be a smart exercise. That would be repetitive. But if they're just learning to swim and they're having to um, follow all the directions and learn all the strokes, and um, that would be more of a smart exercise. And just using that as a, as a um, starting point, if you were, let's say for this this young man, you guys all recommended exercise, which I think is a good idea. Let's say you wanted to do swimming with him. So if you wanted to work on inhibition with swimming, maybe you have different things that sink that you throw into the pool and you tell him, I only want you to get the cars and leave behind the fruits but maybe his special interests are fruits. And so that takes a lot of self-control for him to leave those behind. Or you could work on work, working memory by having, telling him you're gonna go shopping and put all of the little, um, put all the fruits on one end of the pool and on the other end say, okay, today when we go shopping, we're gonna get these three items. Now go. And then he swims down and he gathers those items and comes back. So that would be working memory. 
or cognitive flexibility, of course, would be if you're just in, in, um, incorporating novelty or change to it. So he expects that you're going to do one activity, but instead you change it up and do it slightly differently. Um, I just like to do all sorts of crazy things for my kids where they think, oh, we're going to play soccer, we're going to use our feet, but instead we're using brooms to hit it around, the ball around, just to challenge that cognitive flexibility. So it really has to do with how you implement it more than it has to do with the exercise itself. I hope that answers the question. I think you guys brought some really good ideas to the table. I love that someone brought up the co-op approach. That's an example of cognitive trill, um, cognitive skill training and doing the memory games and the puzzles. Those are all good ideas for working on the cognition. Um, I have a slide maybe, Kate, we could share um, where it shows what, what I actually did. This is an actual client of mine. And when I tested him, he did come out with impairments and in, inhibition and cognitive flexibility, just like you uh, suggested. However, his working memory was average. So I didn't target that part at all during intervention. And I used the table tennis protocol that we reviewed earlier and created some different activities for him to do and implemented that over a 12 week period. And then I retested them and I was super pleased to find that his skills had improved. So it was an effective intervention for him. And not only was it effective, but the family loved it. They said, oh, we're, you know, I trained them on how to do it at home and they were practicing at home and they felt like they had something fun and meaningful that they could do with their son um, that he was engaged in. So it was an overall very successful intervention. Is it too hard to share the slide with all the... Yeah, fine. sorry. I don't think I saved the answers. Oh, no, it's fine. Technology is hard. Um, I will tell you guys just a few in case, you know, I just think it's nice to have almost like a, a menu that you can pull from when you're trying to come up with treatment ideas. So I'll give you a few examples of how... I made the table tennis into like a smart executive function exercise. So we, I had him, I would have different targets and say, I want you to hit all the yellow balls to this target and all the white balls to that target, for example. So that's a working memory. Or I would have him normally when you do table tennis, you know, you're hitting it like this, or sometimes we we have the, the paddle and then we just tap the ball like this. But to challenge his flexibility, I had him put the ball rest it on the paddle, and then just try to walk across an obstacle course like that. So it's cognitive flexibility. Um, I also worked on really increasing his heart rate because I wanted to get that beautiful neurological um, environment for learning. And so we did a lot of exercise kind of things where we would like do five taps and then drop the paddle and try to run and hit the target first. Um, and then also just working with different like stroke patterns and calling out different things so that he had to be really attentive and switching his plan depending on what I said. So those are some uh, activities that I did with him. Well, great, thank you. Does anyone have any uh, questions for Michelle? You're a great presenter, by the way. Kudos oh, to you. you. That's so nice. It is a skill for sure. Um, does anyone have any questions for Michelle? Okay, um, I will send out the PDF of the slides from Michelle to our group like I normally do. They are uploaded to OT Echo, but if you're having um, an trouble, Antonios, it's no problem. Um, Michelle's given us permission to share the slides, so I will email them to everyone like I normally do. No problem. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Michelle, you're fantastic. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to email everyone, and uh, Michelle provided us with this case study this month, but for next month, it'd be really great if you all provided the case study um, If for someone that you're actually treating. So I'll send out with the, um, the PowerPoint slides from Michelle, I'll send out next month's uh, topic area so that if you have um, a case study, you can email Kelsey. I'll put Kelsey's uh, email um, and just take out any patient information. So 
if the patient's name is Kelsey, make it Kate, right? For um, just respecting the patient and, and no date of birth or anything like that. And then we can use your case study um, to really help you with your patients that you're currently seeing. So you'll get an email from me and thank you so much for everyone, for your patience and for um, joining OT Echo. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, everyone.